Once again, thank you all for being here on this beautiful day. It's um, quite something to get this room full time after time on a day like this, especially after yesterday. Uh, we're all glad you're here, as you hopefully know by now. We're um, very glad for all your support and attendance. It's the reason that we keep presenting the Book Festival all these many years. Um, we're also very especially grateful to our sponsors, our lead sponsors, the White Elephant and the Nantucket Athenaeum, where we are now, on our important sponsor, WCAI, our NPR station, uh, the Inquirer and Mirror, uh, N Magazine, uh, all make it possible for us to continue to put on the festival and to do the work that we do in the schools throughout the year, which is very important to us. Uh, as also is the ability to present the, this festival to you without charge, almost exclusively our presentations. We hope that we will always be able to do that. So uh, we thank our supporters and friends. Um, I hope that you will now silence your phones. I want to let you know that uh, Jessica Bruder will be signing books to my right. Uh, books will also be for sale. And I will now give you Mindy Todd, who is the WCAA, WCAI Managing Director uh, of Editorial and the host of The Point, who is going to be in conversation with Jessica Bruder. She will also introduce Jess for you. So thank you. Hi. How's everybody doing? Feeling OK? Beautiful day. Here comes Jess, Jessica Bruder. Let's see right there. Um, Jess is a journalist who reports on, yes, thank you, on subcultures and economic justice. She also teaches at Columbia Journalism School. And of course, her book is Nomad Land, which we're gonna talk about in a second. But first, I'm like really intrigued about this beat of subcultures and economic justice. How did you end up there? A uh, long and winding road. <laughs> uh, I've always been a huge subculture nerd. I don't know what it is, but when I read long form narrative, I get really excited about the opportunity to peek into these micro worlds. One story I often teach is David Grand's City of Water from The New Yorker, looking at the guys called sand hogs who are digging that third water tunnel in New York and just the fraternity that grew up around that. So these kind of non-blood families, these tribes that are brought together sometimes by adversity, sometimes by common interest, in a world that seems increasingly polarized, subcultures are really a sweet spot for me. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about this tribe in Nomadland. How did, how did, first of all, how did you find out about them and then secondly, the numbers, I, I was amazed at the numbers. I mean, we don't even really have a, a, a clear picture sure. of what the numbers are. Yeah, so the, the backstory in terms of how I stumbled on them is actually slightly boring, but I'd like to share it anyway, mm -hmm. because I feel uh, when I was just kind of coming up as a young journalist, I felt like stories sprung out of people's heads fully formed, like Athena out of Zeus's <laughs> noggin, and it was this incredibly intimidating thing. Where did they get the inspiration? And uh, often it's super mundane. Uh, and in my case, I read a lot about labor issues, and I'm really interested in how digital culture and digital technology are changing the traditional debates over labor in America. So, oh gosh, back in 2012 or 2013, the Allentown Morning Call had that crazy scoop about an Amazon warehouse where instead of installing air conditioning so the workers could do their jobs. When it went up to triple digit temperatures, they had ambulances with paramedics parked outside. So they pretty much had the equivalent of a big old spatula in there, pick them up when they fall over and ship them to the hospital. Uh, as, as excited I get when a small scrappy newspaper gets a scoop, and I still do, that's in my blood, I was pretty horrified. Um, and so I kept reading about warehouse work. And there was another story in Mother Jones where someone went undercover and there was one paragraph, maybe two, where this woman said to the reporter, oh yeah, I'm here, I'm a full-time RVer, and I can't afford to retire, and that's why I'm doing this really difficult warehouse work, walking miles a day on this concrete floor to do pick and pack before the holidays. Uh, and there's a whole program Amazon has for people like me. And you know, the story continued after that, but I got completely hung up. Uh, I went, what, 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 and I, uh, you know when you've got a story that you're just completely obsessed with? I mean, I went into utter research mode and realized that not only did Amazon have this program called Camper Force that began in 2008, just months after the housing crash, whether you think that's a coincidence or not is up to you, 
um, but that that was part of a giant ecosystem of work camping jobs, which is what they call them, throughout the country, hiring people who had, by and large, given up traditional housing to go full-time nomadic, living in RVs, living in vans, all sorts of conveyances, uh, often not what they imagined doing because many of them were just working the circuit uh, because their plans of a more traditional retirement had pretty much failed them. Yeah. And, you know, we have this image of the retired person in the RV, kind of this glimmer, oh, camping from here and there. And this is like so not It's a that. little different. <laughs> yeah, it's the yeah. last of the, I, I always saw RVers. I mean, it's, RV stands for recreational vehicle, right? So when I saw an RV go by, I'd go, there go the last of the great pensioners. They're going to Niagara Falls. They're going to the Grand Canyon. Uh, but sometimes in between, they're doing soul-crushing labor. Uh, and that, that was not something I was aware of before I started researching the story. And they, they don't like to be called homeless. They're houseless. Oh, heck so, no. Yeah, yeah. yeah, a lot of people I met in late model RVs and vans, I, it was a guy named Al Christensen who first explained this to me. He was a former advertising creative director who went from having what he called a virtual job to being virtually unemployed when the market was contracting and younger people who could be paid less were basically funneling in and he found himself out of work, moved into a van and explained to me, you know, I'm not homeless, I'm houseless. I have shelter, I have transportation uh, and this is what I'm doing. And there's such a stigma on the word homeless right. in our culture. It really reflects a modern day caste system mindset. So you can't blame anybody for wanting to avoid the stigma of that. So getting back to the numbers for a second, you talked about, you know, Amazon, Camp Amazon and, and these other, you know, kind of migrant jobs that they go in. There's also a lot of camp, campgrounds and a lot in the national uh, parks where they hire. And the uh, president of the Recreation Resource Management, which manages 110 campgrounds, there's a lot more than 110, but just his 110, says 50,000 people apply for 50 jobs. Yeah, that blew my mind when I saw that because this is a workforce that's largely uncounted. If you live full time on the road, uh, you know, our culture isn't set up for that. Everybody needs a street address. You need it to vote. You need it for your driver's license, which is crucial for this population. You need it for car insurance. And you're basically not treated as a citizen unless you have an address. So everybody has to be domiciled, is what they call it, somewhere. So some folks will use a mail forwarding service, others will use a family's address, um, but it still means it's pretty much impossible to count people. They're a demographer's nightmare. So when people ask me, how big is this population? If I look at the small slice of the subculture that was at the heart of my story, so that would be people who are at or nearing traditional retirement age, who got pushed out of traditional what nomads refer to as stick and brick housing, uh, and who are working this kind of circuit of jobs around the country, my really conservative estimate, because I'm, I'm a journalist at heart and numbers are important to me, is tens of thousands. And you're saying, you know, 50,000 alone for this, so right. you can tell I'm being conservative. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but if we broaden it to people who uh, did get pushed out of traditional housing, because wages are flat, Housing costs keep going up. This is a huge problem. People forget that federal minimum wage has been stalled at 725 for nearly a decade, that there are only 12 counties in the country where a full-time minimum wage worker can afford a one-bedroom apartment at fair market rent. Like, this is a big problem, a big tearing away. So when we look at how many folks are out on the road, probably due to those factors and doing a retirement that's not quite what they planned. I think that's when we get into the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. And when we look at people who are dealing with these social forces and solving them in all sorts of ways, whether it's nomadism or sleeping on the grandkids' couch, then we're probably in the millions. Yeah. So let's talk about some of the people um, you highlight in the book. And one of them is Linda May. She's sort of your main character, if you will. Um, and Linda is it, it's interesting because you met other women like Linda, and it's kind of unusual, a woman of, and especially women of that, of that age, traveling alone. And these have to be really strong women. I was amazed at some of the things they've been able And Linda is really interesting. She's got a really positive attitude about all this and very optimistic. So tell us a little bit about Linda and some of the other people. Yeah, Linda's fantastic. Uh, and it's funny, you noted how many strong, solo traveling women were on the road, if I can address that for a second. Yes, absolutely. Uh, my best friend, the journalist Dale Maharaj, was out on the road in the 80s with kind of the newly dispossessed, riding the rails, doing all sorts of stuff. 
And he never saw solo women. Never, never. So when I started getting out there in this van that I named Halen because I'm a big dork, uh, and I'm driving around and I'm, I'm meeting all these older, fierce, fantastic, super self-reliant women, he, he was just saying, you know, this is amazing. And then thinking about it, women outlive men. A lot of the women I met grew up in a culture where they were expected to marry. Back then, you could support a family of three on a full-time minimum wage income, right? And, uh, and that was fine. So a lot of people, divorce rates go up, people are living longer, social security is lower for women because of the gender wage gap. So I shouldn't have been surprised, but yeah. I was. And that's how I met Linda. Linda had basically been stuck on the low wage treadmill for most of her life. Uh, like a lot of women, she'd also had some time out of the workforce because women do most of the unpaid caregiving in our culture. So she'd cared for, you know, she was a single mom and she cared for her mom when her mom had terminal cancer. Linda had done everything from working as a cocktail waitress in a casino to de-feathering ducks and quails at a hunting lodge to working in insurance to owning a flooring store. I mean, you name it, Linda's been there yeah. at the Home Depot. And she pretty much realized as she was getting older and she'd been reduced from a Home Depot project manager. She had experience as a general contractor so she can give you building advice like no one's business to working the register. And then those shifts were getting fewer and further between. And she realized her social security was only gonna be about $500 a month and that she was pretty much never gonna have a traditional retirement. And that's how she got out on the road and met a, lo a lot of other people like LaVon, who was a former journalist and living in a vehicle called LaVan. <laughs> yeah. Sylvie Ann DeMars, who had worked as a waitress and an astrologer and was living in a former convict labor van mm. that she named the Queen Maria Esmeralda. And if you've ever been to that store called Anthropology and seen the housing section, that's kind of what it looks like inside. So really amazing and colorful cast of characters out there, um, which was really, as a lover of people <laughs> uh, and a, a writer, was really you know quite lucky for me. All right, let's talk about an interesting man that you met, Bob Wells. Bob Wells. Who started CheaprVLiving.com, which is a, a very helpful website for any of these people who are living this nomadic lifestyle. Oh my gosh, absolutely. And when I first met and first encounter cheap RV living. So like many of us, when Linda wonders about something in the world nowadays, you know, like, you know, how am I gonna survive my retirement? Well, she asked Google <laughs> and she found Bob's website. Mm -hmm. And on the front page, there was a budget for how you can live on $500 a month. Bob's history was that he was a union Safeway clerk back when that was a pretty stable word. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Right. Um, you know, we, as you're talking, I'm wondering what happens when some of the people through the aging process or health issues that they get to a point where they can't travel anymore, they can't work anymore. And, you know, in the world outside of the one you're describing, there are, you know, ways that gets taken care of. What, what happens when people just get old and can't do yeah. they need to do. This was a question that picked up my brain through all three years of research here, because obviously this wasn't a longitudinal study. This is more of a short narrative, deep dive, run around like a lunatic and meet people. But, you know, time continues. And part of me was terrified, too. It was just in the years after the book, am I just going to watch the gradual decline and falling apart of all these people with no place to go? Uh, just kind of staring down that barrel really scared me a lot. Um, and when I interviewed people out on the road, I'd often ask them just what you're asking me. What's your plan for when you can't drive anymore? What's your plan for when your vision's not good enough? I mean, it's... And some people... God, Bob told me that his long-term health care plan was bleached bones in the desert. There were people who just said, I don't want to be around when I can't do this anymore. This is it. Um, there are people who said, you know, I really don't want to fall back on my kids. My kids are in challenging circumstances of their own, but at some point I'll have to do that. I'm just putting it off as long as I can. This is part of, we've seen the decline uh, in some, some sub-segments of the culture of multi-generational housing. People just really feel like they need to do it themselves. Uh, and then there are a couple instances where I won't sugarcoat this. Swanky was out there on the road and she had met this guy. She thought some of his family was maybe coming to help him out. 
they both liked to paint a lot and they'd checked out each other's artwork and were getting along pretty well. They were way off the grid. And she didn't see him for a couple days. And she walked by and she saw that there were some flies on the screen of his RV. And exactly what you might presume happened, happened. She called the police, they called the coroner, she was horrified. Uh, you know, I've heard multiple stories of people, you know, people die everywhere and they don't say you, the cause was poverty, you know, they'll come back to some, but, but often so many of these people are un underserved when it comes to medical care. Um, so again, I, I, I have encountered a bunch of stories of people dying on the road, so that can happen. One more question. Right here, where's the microphone? Okay, right here. Are you aware if uh, this type of subculture exists in other countries and other cultures as well? I think it's funny. There's definitely a lively vanning, caravanning culture in Europe, for example. Uh, and there have always been dispossessed people everywhere. I mean, we're, we're living in a time of extraordinary migrations, right? Um, just incredible numbers of dispossessed people. But when you look at vehicle dwellers, I think there's so many places where if that culture began as a recreational culture, uh, you know, again, lots of Europe, right? But those are cultures that have much stronger safety nets in terms of housing, in terms of medical care. So I don't think it's become a, a thing of last resort uh, the way I've seen it here in some cases. So I think we're a little unique. Exceptionalism, right? So, Jessica Bruder, author of Nomadland. Thank, thank you, you for so coming much out. for being Appreciate here. It. Thank you all for coming.